I've been trying to keep these podcasts shorter to allow more time for discussion. This one is going to be long, and I'm sorry. There is simply so much information I need to download as we finish up this unit. I hope we can make it up to you a little with good discussion as you make your presentations in the next class. We last visited Egypt in around 2500 BCE, the height of the Old Kingdom's fourth dynasty, and the three great pyramid pharaohs, Khufu, Khafre, and Menkera. Well, I hope your time machine seatbelts are fastened because we are now jumping forward about 1,000 years. I am skipping over civil war, invasions, an entire set of very successful dynasties, the Middle Kingdom, and still more invasions. Sorry about that. We are landing in the New Kingdom. Make sure your seatbelts are fastened, your seats are upright, and your tray tables are fully fastened. So just how new is this new kingdom anyway? If we look at a series of pharaoh statues moving from Khafre enthroned, 2570 BCE, to King Tut's inner coffin, 1320 BCE, it doesn't look as if much has changed in Egyptian art or culture over 1,200 years. And there's a lot of truth to that. The pharaoh remains an all-powerful ruler, semi-divine, responsible for maintaining ma'at and securing the safety and prosperity of the kingdom. But New Kingdom, kingdom Egypt is at least somewhat new. The map on the left shows Old Kingdom Egypt, really just a narrow strip of land on either side of the Nile. As the map on the right indicates, in the New Kingdom, Egypt became an imperial power. And that meant that Egyptian pharaohs had to impose their authority, not only on Egyptians, but on peoples whom they conquered. This isn't a required work, it's a very cool one. Uh, note that Ramses II, probably the most powerful of the New Kingdom pharaohs, built this temple to himself down at the border with Nubia, which today is Sudan. Think maybe he was trying to make an impression on newly conquered people? All four of these statues, by the way, are statues of Ramses himself. You'll note that Ramses is decked out pretty much like all the other pharaohs we've studied. But the choice to glorify himself with a temple rather than a pyramid is typical of the New Kingdom. The New Kingdom also brought some changes in the concept of the pharaoh and his depiction in art. During the Old Kingdom, the pharaoh ruled as the son of God, the incarnation of Horus, son of Osiris. Remember that uh, Horus perched on Khafre's shoulder? During the New Kingdom, the pharaoh featured increasingly as the chosen representative of the gods, the intermediary between the people and the gods. Much of the art from this period shows the king being embraced or touched by the gods, making offerings to the gods, and receiving symbols that the gods supported them. Here you see a bas-relief sculpture from an Egyptian temple. The New Kingdom pharaoh Seti I is making offerings to Amun, and no, this is not a required work either. As you can see from this diagram, temples had always been part of the pyramid complex. You should remember that from the pyramid plan as well. But pharaohs stopped building pyramids after the Old Kingdom fell. There are a lot of theories about why this happened. Pyramid tubes certainly were always getting robbed, so the pharaohs started digging secret tombs deep in the hills, away from temples where the now deified pharaoh was worshipped. The human and financial cost of building the pyramids put pharaohs deeply in debt and may have helped bring down the old kingdom, but then the temples we're about to see didn't come cheap either. New Kingdom temples fall into two general categories, temples to gods and temples to pharaohs. That's a little misleading, however, since temples to pharaohs, like the temple at Abu Simbel that you just saw, always included uh, room shrines devoted to the gods, especially to the chief god of the New Kingdom, Amun-Re. When the founder of the 18th dynasty expelled the Hyksos invaders, his hometown, Thebes, became the most important city in Egypt. Thebes' patron deity was Amun, whose identity then merged with the sun god, Re, who was already worshipped throughout Egypt. The pharaohs of the new dynasty attributed their many military victories to Amun, and they lavished much of the loot they captured on temples to this god. The temple at Karnak is the largest of these. Indeed, it is the second largest ancient religious site in the world, second only to Angkor Wat Temple of Cambodia. Stay tuned for Unit 4. Your readings gave you a lot of information about this famous site and introduced some important vocabulary. Let's quickly review. What is circled in red? Oh, that is a pylon gate. Note the slanting sides. They represented two mountains between which, according to the Egyptian religion, the sun rose and set. What about the green circle? 
That's a bird's eye view of the hypostyle hall, really a forest of columns. So let's watch the first of several short video clips from a documentary on this temple. The entire video in three parts is up on Moodle, and I highly recommend it, although I have to tell you, it probably deserves an R rating. Why? Oh, watch it and find out. For now, we're just making a flyover. The temple at Karnak actually had a series of these pylon gates built over time. Construction of this temple began in the Middle Kingdom and continued throughout to the Greek Ptolemaic dynasties. That included Cleopatra, who hung out with Julius Caesar at the very end of the period we call BCE. More than 30 pharaohs added buildings or rooms to this temple, and sticking out a few more pylons was a favorite form of remodeling. So what purpose did these pylons serve? The term is usually, by the way, used for the support for bridges, but these pylons weren't holding anything up. Instead, uh, they were designed to impress, if not overwhelm. Anyone entering these gates was entering the precincts of the gods, and most people, by the way, couldn't enter the gates. The temple was a sacred precinct, the actual house of the gods, so the pylons were a kind of barrier between the daily world of the people and the eternal world of the gods, and as we'll see, the pharaoh. By now, you should know that I goofed and left this plan out of your workbook, and you should have a copy taped into your workbook now. Note all the additions made by different pharaohs. You do not have to memorize this, but do make sure you know how to read the plan. So, look, starting from the left, after going through the pylon gates, the worshiper would enter a large courtyard, and um, from there would move into the hypostyle hall. That's what all those dots in the center left represent. They re represent columns, as they will on all the many floor plans that we're going to be looking at in this course. This kind of plan, by the way, is called an axial plan. Basically, entrance to succeeding rooms is straight down uh, the horizontal axis. The College Board's required image of the hypostyle hall, which is on the upper left, does not really give you a good sense of just how vast this forest of columns really is. So I've included a panoramic shot. This is an acre of columns. Note how small the people are in comparison with the columns. The columns were also, as you can see from the upper right, elaborately carved in sunken relief. Now, this is a form of sculpture uh, that was particularly appropriate in the harsh Egyptian sun because it created deep shadows and had the additional virtue that it did not disguise the basic shape of the columns. Uh, just to talk about relief sculpture a little more, you see two examples uh, of sunken relief sculpture on the left. On top, Ramses II is making offerings to Amun-Re, and on the bottom, Seti I is smiting some Libyans. Note that the two justifications for the pharaoh's right to rule have not changed since the Palate of Narmer. The pharaoh assures the people a close relationship with, the protection of the gods, and the pharaoh wins wars. There were also many raised relief sculptures at Karnak as well. Basically, every bit of the walls is covered with sculpture. Uh, on the upper right, you see Seti I offering an ointment jar to the god. That's, none of these is a required work. The images are somewhat misleading. You've heard me say that before. These relief sculptures would have been brightly painted. Take a look at that model on the bottom. The photo on the left also shows the hugely important architectural innovation that first appeared in New Kingdom temples. High clerestory windows that let in light. Uh, that term, clerestory, shows up on the AP test all the time, and it's one of the enduring understandings or essential knowledges or whatever listed for this course. So know it. Hypostyle halls were actually intended to represent a marsh at the beginning of time. So the columns were intended to resemble papyrus plants. In the dark corners, the columns looked like papyrus plants with closed flowers. In the center, where the light shone in, the columns would look like papyrus plants blooming in the sun. It's important to understand that ancient Egyptian temples were seen as the place where the gods actually resided on earth. In fact, the term the Egyptians most commonly used to describe a temple building means, quote, mansion or enclosure of a god. So it's no surprise, really, that only the priests and the pharaoh were allowed to enter the hypostyle hall. Remember that exclusivity is one of the characteristics of many sacred spaces. Oops. 
The sanctuary was the most special and important part of the temple. It was a very dark and mysterious place. Only the high priest and the pharaoh could ever enter the sanctuary. So in the middle of the sanctuary stood the shrine where the statue of the god or goddess resided. Remember, again, the ancient Egyptians believed that during rituals, the god or goddess would actually enter the statue. When the pharaoh wasn't available to conduct the daily rituals, which was most of the time, the high priest would ritually clean the god's image, then offer it food and drink. Let's watch another brief video clip about these rituals. I just think this is very interesting. On special festival days, the cult statue would be carried from the temple to a boat on the Nile, carried to another ritual site, and then brought back. Let's watch one last video clip about the pharaoh's role in this important ceremony. Well, I've already lingered longer at Karnak than we really have time for. If you'd like to see and know more, again, check out the video documentaries on Moodle. Oops, trying to get my iPad to cooperate. Now, finally, we move to the second kind of temple, a mortuary temple honoring a pharaoh. The plan is not a required image, but I included the label plan in your workbook images. I just think it makes it helpful. Note that the temple includes shrines to gods other than the pharaoh. But this is no ordinary pharaoh. So let's turn to a clip from another very good video. Actually, you saw part of this in the last class when the whole thing's up on Moodle. It's called Engineering an Empire. And learn a little bit more about Queen Hatshepsut. The statue on the right, by the way, uh, excuse me, on the left is one of your required images. I added the statue of Hatshepsut as a Finx because I think it's very cool. Both of these are in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and both were painstakingly reconstructed by museum curators from tiny fragments. Let's watch the video and find out why she ended up in bits. I'm not going to say a lot more about the temple. You just saw it in the video. But here are a few vocabulary words that you might need to know. I haven't seen these terms on an AP exam in the past, but this work is receiving more focus now, so you might need to know them. Oh, that time I let it build. So here's the labeled floor plan again that's in your workbook. Notice the two long causeways leading up to the chamfered pillars, past the colonnades, and beyond them to the hypostyle hall. I mentioned that the Met reconstructed these uh, statues from fragments. Hatshepsut's stepson, Tatmos III, had all of the statues of the female pharaoh destroyed. So why was that such a violent and shocking act? Well, remember, the pharaoh's ka actually lived in these statues. Destroy the statues, destroy the ka, destroy Hatshepsut's chance at the afterlife. This was one vengeful uh, stepson. And alas, that's all the time we have for this fascinating pharaoh. The next pharaoh is going to be even stranger. Let's begin with a video introduction to Akhenaten. The images on this slide are not required works, although they used to show up frequently on the AP exam. We've seen a lot of pharaohs in the last three days, but none that looked quite like this. So why did he look so weird? Well, texts in Amarna tombs describe the god Aten as a mother and father of us all. And some scholars think that for this reason, Akhenaten deliberately chose to have himself portrayed as having both male and female figures. That's, by the way, what the term androgynous means, having male and female features. It's a good word to add to your vocabulary. Other scholars speculate that these statues captured aspects of Akhenaten's real appearance and maybe even deformity stemming from too much inbreeding. Lots of marrying your sisters among pharaohs. Uh, it has a long skull. I'm sorry, indeed a mummy has been identified that may be Akhenaten. It has a long skull and an elongated chin. But our Khan Academy scholars think that the changes from rectilinear to more curvilinear forms simply reflect Akhenaten's determination to demonstrate his new religion, his new regimes, break with the past by developing a new set of artistic conventions. Very un-Egyptian of him, but he wasn't a very Egyptian sort of pharaoh, was he? Note, too, that while these depictions may have been more naturalistic, they still obeyed strict conventions. All of the art from this period shows long faces, pointed chins, swollen bellies, and in general, more curving lines. Egyptian artists had not adopted a purely optical approach. 
Well, the Khan Academy scholars do a great job with this work, so let me just repeat and add to a few key points. Note how the artist departs from hierarchy of scale, or at least grants Akhenaten and Nefertiti virtually equal status. I've already noted the softer curvilinear lines. We know that Akhenaten was a huge nature lover. Remains of his nature preserves have been found at the site Tel El Amrana, where his city was. It's possible that the new religion's emphasis on nature led to more naturalistic portrayals and art. Notice, too, the sun with the rays, the symbol of Aten, and how these rays seem to be pointing at the two representatives on Aten and Earth, Akhenaten and his wife Nefertiti. She got much more central billing than wives of pharaohs generally did. Uh, the hands reaching out to the king and queen, as you know from the video, actually end with the Ankh, the symbol of the breath of life. Even more striking is how intimate this family portrait seems to be. This is a plausible picture of a loving family and shows much more emotion than is usually permitted in Egyptian art. On the other hand, again, we still see composite figures with the body in profile and the frontal eye. We still see the uraeus or cobra on the sun. Uh, we see the symbols of both Lower and Upper Egypt on the Queen's throne, so this is still a pharaoh. Whoops, forgot to build that one again. While Akhenaten's religious and political revolution didn't last long, sorry, this is blurry, I took it from a video and I couldn't get it to pause properly. During the last years of his reign, Akhenaten stopped paying attention to what was happening outside his new city, Amarna, and many subject people started to rebel. So when Akhenaten died, the priests defaced his images. Here, what you see, not very well, is what was once Akhenaten driving a chariot, that part's been rubbed out and all that's left is Aten. And we all know what the consequences of, of wiping out the image were for the Ka. The stele of the family that we just looked at probably survived because it was a private house altar and was not an image in the temple. It was discovered at excavations in Amarna. Let's watch one last clip from this video and see what happened next. Last work of this unit. Whew. It is probably the most famous image from ancient Egypt, but actually the tomb so famously discovered by Howard Carter was a relatively minor tomb of a minor pharaoh who, after all, died when he was still a teenager and before he could accomplish much of anything. Just imagine what the tomb of Ramses II must have contained before the tomb robbers made away with the loot. The mummy cover used quarter a quarter ton of beaten gold, as well as precious stones, lapis lazuli, turquoise, and carnelian. But notice, too, a return to conventional depictions of a pharaoh, including the calm, distant serenity of the face, not unlike Khafre's. The proportions, such as the distance between the nose and the lips, indicate a youth, a healthy, even perfect youth. But we have Tut's mummy, so we know that this is deceiving. DNA studies revealed that Tut had a cleft palate, a club foot, and that he'd contracted malaria before he died, suggesting that he had a weakened immune system as well. We also know that his mother and father, and his mother was not Nefertiti, were full siblings. Finally, Tutankhamun was buried with walking sticks that doctors who examined him think he probably needed to walk. Traditional pharaonic symbols abound. The Nemes headcloth, the false beard inlaid with precious jewels, the kingly Uraeus cobra of Lower Egypt combined with the vulture neck bet of Upper Egypt. Note how similar this is to the Narmer palette in its evocation of the union of Upper and Lower Egypt. You may also recall that gold and lapis lazuli were favorite royal decorative elements in Mesopotamia. Well, I warned you that I would be long-winded today, and you may well have run out of time, but just in case you haven't, this video clip includes some wonderful archival footage of Howard Carter's famous discovery of King Tut's tomb and some fun clips from cheesy old movies as well. I'll be putting up a test review podcast soon. Then we're on to the Greeks and Romans, a unit with a lot of works, but also one that our past students have really enjoyed.